Hi, everybody, and welcome to Cracking the Code to Productivity with a Container-First Approach. Today's webinar is sponsored by Docker and produced by Actual Tech Media. Uh, my name is Keith Ward, as you might have guessed. I'm with Actual Tech Media, and I am really excited to be your moderator for this especially timely presentation. Uh, but before we get to today's content, there are a few housekeeping issues, a few housekeeping things that uh, will help you get the most out of this session. So let's go through those real quick. First off, we want this to be an informative event for you. So we encourage any questions in the questions box in your webinar control panel. We'll have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the presentation to dive into some of the top questions that you ask. Now, that Q&A panel is also the place to let us know about any technical issues that you might be experiencing today. So a browser refresh is the first thing you want to do if you have any uh, audio, video uh, issues like that. And uh, if that doesn't work, though, let us know in the Q&A and we'll get right on it and try to help you out. All right, next. In the handout section of your webinar control panel, you will find a ton of important information to download. Most importantly, take a look at the host of Docker resources that are included. Now, they include a discount code to DockerCon. How about that? Uh, a white paper, information on Docker Scout, and a lot more. Just some great free resources and discounts that I strongly encourage you to take a look at now and throughout uh, the event today. Other resources you'll find in the handout section include a link to the Gorilla Guide Book Club, where you can get access to our vast library of printed resources on a host of technology topics. There you will also find a link to the ATM Events Center, which has our calendar of upcoming events. We've got some great shows coming up. Look them over, and if you see one or more that you like, you know, sign up uh, today. All right, third, at the, end of at the end of this webinar event, we will be awarding a $250 Amazon gift card to one lucky registrant. Now, you do have to be in attendance during the entire event to qualify for the prize. If you want to read the official terms and conditions of the prize drawing, you can also find those in the handout section right there at the bottom. Okay. And finally, uh, one of the really hi uh, highlights of this or any actual tech media event is the opportunity to ask questions of our expert presenters. So to help encourage those questions, we have a special additional prize for you today. Uh, that is another Amazon gift card, this one for 50 bucks for the best question. So after the event's over, we'll take a look at all the questions that come in, we'll pick out the best one, and we'll contact that prize winner. And with that, why don't we get to the main event here today? Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter, Michael Irwin, who is a Senior Manager of Developer Relations uh, for Docker. Michael. It is great to have you here today. So uh, if you are already, you can just take it away. Awesome. Well, Keith, thanks uh, for the introduction. And I'm, I'm excited to be here and to be representing Docker um, as we're uh, you know, helping people understand and, and figure out how to, to use containers and why they should use containers and whatnot. And so with that, actually, I'm going to uh, I'll bring up my title slide here and uh, cracking the code of productivity with a container first approach. Um, there's lots of different ways that we can do development in the the, the modern era of software development um, and containers being one of the, the, the biggest ways to, to do so. And so today we're, we're going to talk about what a container first approach even means, why it's important, what values it brings. Um, and my goal, um, by the end of this session, you're not going to become an expert in this area. Sorry if that's your expectation, but I hope that by by leaving this session, you've become inspired and understand a little bit more of what a container first approach can bring you why it's important and, and again be inspired to, to go seek out more information and and, uh, and hopefully we can help you out there to start off with i want to start off by um, sharing docker's vision and this is something that we share internally at all of our all hands meetings we talk about it in our team meetings and and how we can really drive all of our products and efforts towards this vision and the vision is simple we want to help increase the time that developers spend on innovation and decrease the time they spend on everything else that's our that's our north star, and that's what we're we're aiming for. That's what we're trying to help um, developers get to, um, because at the end of the day, as a developer tooling company, we're successful if the developers using our tools are successful. And by being successful for 
uh, our customers, that means that they're able to ship products faster, that they're able to, to fix issues more, more quickly, that they're able to um, troubleshoot and find out why is this not working right in production? Um, how can I validate that and recreate those same conditions locally? So there's lots of different things that, that play into this. Um, and again, it's something that Docker is, is working really hard to do so that developers can be efficient, they can be secure, they can be reliable, um, and they can be as productive as possible. And we'll, we'll talk about a lot of those things as we go throughout the session today. Now, I, I want to start off by actually talking about life in the non-container world. Um, so imagine that I've got a scenario here where I've got four different applications that I want to deploy. Um, apps one and two are using the same language and same version. So maybe it's a Java application, for example, uh, and they're both using the same version of, of that, uh, that Java runtime. Um, and each of those applications are, for the most part, using the same set of libraries. There's just different code bases um, uh, running from there. But now I want to deploy application three, and I want to use a newer version of, of Java or Python or, or whatever it might be. Um, and so I, I want to deploy this application use a new version. Now, that new version may still be using same of the, some of the same libraries and operating system dependencies from the, the other version of, of uh, my language runtime. But then there's also updated versions. Okay, and then now I've got application four that another team is developing that's a completely different language. Uh, maybe they're using Node or Go or Ruby or something else. Um, and so we have all these different applications that have different runtimes, that have different dependencies. Um, and some of those dependencies may step on each other's toes when they're installed on the same machine or, um, while others may play nicely with each other. Um, and in fact, it, in, in many developer circles, we kind of call this dependency hell, that there's, there's there's just this web of dependencies and trying to untangle the web is tricky. Um, so traditionally, the way that we've deployed applications has been, well, let's just take each of those verticals, each of those applications, and we're going to deploy them independently. And traditionally, the way that we would provide that isolation is by saying, hey, spin up a virtual machine for each of those applications. Uh, so there's a, a virtual machine for application one, for application two, three, and four. And then all of the, the dependencies and runtimes and everything that that application needs is installed in that virtual machine. There's isolation. There's zero chance that app one can affect app three and vice versa. There's, there's strong isolation there. Now, if we actually take a look at this, we, we see that there's, there, there's some trouble here, okay? Because if, if I'm running a small weight application and uh, statistics vary depending on, on the application, but most environments, most applications are only sitting between 10 and 20% uh, utilization, CPU, memory, et cetera. Um, and, and if we look at the overhead of an operating system, there's an entire kernel and there's memory management and scheduling. There's, there's just a lot of overhead that's involved when we start isolating applications this way. So what, what containers do is they allow us to package up these applications and, and distribute them. We'll, we'll talk about that here in just a second, but with much less overhead, and it allows our applications to be much more portable. So I can take my application, I can run it in production, but I can run that same application locally on my machine. And so the, the, the picture here looks something like this with the virtual stack where, or the, the virtual machine stack where I've got my underlying uh, infrastructure and I've got a couple layers there to, to help actually put in the isolation between the virtual machines. But again, for apps one, two, and three, there's you see that there's that guest OS that that's a pretty big box there. Uh, there's a lot of overhead there. Well, if I start using containers, it uses a different isolation mechanism where instead of trying to, to isolate the full operating system, I'm really focused on just isolating that one process, just that one application. And so on the same machine, now I can run apps one, two, and three all on the same machine but they're still isolated from each other. And then there's zero chance that app one can affect app two and can affect app three, et cetera. And so what this means is, in my production environment anyways, I can do a lot more with less infrastructure by, by packing more applications together. I don't have all these guest OSs and the overhead of, of running operating systems. Um, that there's, there's a lot of advantage that comes to that. But what this also means is as a developer, well, now I can I can leverage those same isolation mechanisms uh, to to run multiple containerized applications. You know, some of these may be my actual web apps. Uh, another container may be my database. Another application may be a, a a troubleshooting visualizer for my database. And we'll actually do a demo of that here in just a little bit. So, because of this change in this higher, higher level form of isolation, um, 
it opens up a lot of opportunities for how we package up applications, how we deploy them, and then also how we develop with uh, these applications. A analogy that I, I like to use quite a bit is, is with the, um, especially on the packaging front, is with shipping. Um, so a long time ago, if I were a goods producer, if I wanted to ship my crops or furniture or toys or whatever it is that I'm, I'm producing, I would take bags, barrels, boxes, crates, and I would package my stuff into it and lug it down to the, the shipping dock and say, hey, shipping vendor, can you ship this for me? And they would, you know, as you can see in the, the graphic here, you know, roll the, the barrels up to the, the dock and drop them below the, the deck and, and fill the ship up and then eventually take it across the sea. What's interesting, though, is even though I'm paying them to ship my goods, the ships are actually spending more time at dock loading and unloading than they did actually moving the goods. And it wasn't until the mid-1950s that the standardization around uh, container or the, the shipping containers uh, came about, in which now there's a, a steel box that I can obtain, and the entire shipping industry is standardized around that, and they, can, they know the exact dimensions. They can lift it off of ship using cranes that, again, expect those dimensions and put them on truck chassis, move it around the yard, et cetera. And, and what this allows is just a massive throughput of efficiency with, with shipping. Well, in the software space, we've gone through much the, the same scenario. So if, if we go back to this graphic here, okay, the way that I package up application one, traditionally, I, I create a virtual machine and I'm installing everything on, on that virtual machine. Um, and there, there's a lot of setup that, that has to occur in order to set up that machine to run application one. But with the, the standardization of these higher level isolation mechanisms, now there's basically a standard for a container image that I can package up my application, everything that it needs to run, regardless of whether it's a database or a full on web application or a Minecraft game server or whatever it might be, there's a standardized way to package this thing up. And now I can just ship my app and the binaries and libraries, and I don't have to worry about all the rest of the operating system. So it allows my application to be completely portable, and there's a standardized way to package up this thing and, and move it around, okay? So the question is, where do we see containers? Um, where, where do we see this isolation mechanism? Where do we see the standardized packaging? And honestly, the, the answer is pretty much everywhere. Um, Docker and containers were really first seen kind of up in the, this top left uh, quadrant here with uh, software development. Um, traditional applications, whether monolithic or microservices, um, being used in build pipelines, how we run our, our applications in production. Um, and that's where, where things started. But now we're starting to see that, hey, the ability to package up an application and run it anywhere, now I, I can package up other types of stuff. Um, and so we're seeing in emerging fields with, especially in the AI machine learning and, and data sciences space, a lot of models are being shipped with container images or as container images now. Um, and I'll do a demo here in just a little bit that you know, being able to spin up a Jupyter notebook to do some data science work is incredibly easy to do because again, there's a, a standardized package that somebody has made that allows me to pull this image and run it in an isolated format on my machine. Uh, before joining Docker, I worked in the higher ed space at a, in a university and seeing how containers has completely changed the way that education can be delivered. Um, and lab environments, et cetera, professors no longer have to figure out why is your machine not running the application while this other machine is. Um, and, and again, we'll, we'll see a demo of that here in, in just a moment. And finally, DIYers, I love hacking on, on various things at, at home. I do a lot of home automation kind of stuff. And it's so nice to be able to package up my applications as, as containers and then run them on a Raspberry Pi cluster or, or where, wherever else I, I might want to at home. Um, so again, containers are, are really just seen everywhere. So then the question is, what does Docker provide? What, what does Docker do in this space? Well, Docker helped pioneer the whole container effort um, by introducing the standard uh, for what the box looks like, how we, we build the, the container images, how we deploy them, how do we run them, et cetera. Uh, but today, Docker's got lots of different services to help out. And we'll see some of these uh, here in just a moment when I, I do a demo. But Docker Hub is kind of a central place where I, I store these images and I can share them with either the, the, the world or privately with my team. Um, it's a place that we can, we can share these container images that again, take um, that package up everything that needs to run an application. Docker Desktop is the application that as a developer, I'm running on my local machine. And it provides the ability for me to, to build these images, to build these, these container um, images, to, to run the containers, um, 
and, and do incredible things with them. And then some of our newer products are now, how do we build on this, the success of that? And how do we continue to enhance and, and make it better? And our, our latest one here is Docker Scout. And Docker Scout's really focus on how do we, how do we know what's in the box? How do we know what's in our container image? How do we keep up to date with, with vulnerabilities and issues, but also um, if there's newer versions of the, the Python runtime, how, how do I keep up with those things? Um, so Scout helps me build better boxes, build better images. Um, and, and we're just at the start here. There's a, an entire roadmap that's really focused on secure supply, uh, the secure software supply chain, and really how we can trust where our software came from, but then also when we run it, how do we know that it hasn't been tampered with along the way? And basically from development all the way out to production and build in between and everything else along the way, how do we know we have a secure supply chain there? So lots more to come in that space. But I wanna do a quick demo here and I'm gonna run three different applications. Um, and they're, they're varying applications. Um, one of them's a, a fun one, um, but I'm gonna start off with a Jupyter notebook where typically if I want to run Jupyter on my machine, um, to do some data sciences, I've got to figure out, well, what version of Python do I need? And what dependencies do I need? How do I install this stuff on my machine? And again, make sure that it's not conflicting with other stuff I may already have on my machine. So how do I set that up? The second one is a simple web app that I use in a lot of demos and it's just a, a fun little web app. But again, it's another Python application, but it's using a different version of Python and has a different set of dependencies because it's doing, you know, a, a, it's a web app. And then finally, um, I've got a, an application that, or the, the, the third container here is just running a, a simple database, okay? So the, the first thing I want to do is share my screen. So let me pull that up here. And I'm gonna start off by um, showing off, so this is Docker Hub, and I'm in the, the Explore section here, and we've got quite a bit of trusted content. Um, these are our Docker official images. These are images that we help um, support and maintain uh, with security updates where we work with the vendors and whatnot, so you can see Docker official images, there's a 177 of available as of today. Verified publishers, um, we work with the publisher, we verify their namespaces and the images that they're using. There's certain uh, requirements that they're keeping things up to date as well. And sponsored open source, um, open source projects can um, submit and basically gain free access to a lot of our, our different services and then get badging to, to help uh, find their applications a little bit easier. So in this case, again, I wanna run a Jupyter Notebook. Um, so I can just go in here and search for Jupyter and I can see, cool, there's a sponsored open source project. Um, so this obviously helps elevate it and makes it a little bit more important to me. Um, this Jupyter SciPy Notebook. Um, and as I click into that, I can see a little bit of documentation and, and links and, and whatnot. Um, and so Docker Hub, again, is this, this hub, this centralized um, location where I can find these applications, but then in Docker Desktop, um, I'm gonna search for that same image and then I can just click run. And what's gonna happen is that container image, I've already got to pull it on my machine so we don't have to wait for the download, um, but it's gonna pull down everything that's needed to run that application. And within a couple seconds here, I've got my Jupyter Notebook running. And if I switch back to my browser, give it a second and now my Jupyter Notebook is, is up and running, okay? And that that's pretty cool. So, you know, with, basically just a quick search and then drop into a Docker desktop and saying, I want to run this thing. Everything that was needed to run this application was downloaded and, and set up. Now, I, I wanna make it clear that nothing's actually installed on my machine here. Everything's running in that isolated containerized environment. And so when I'm done, all I have to do is go back to the Docker desktop, hit the little trash icon here, and that container's gone. Um, I don't have to think about Again, what was installed and is it going to conflict with anything else on my machine? It's it's it was running that isolated environment, and now it's gone. Now, so that was an example of uh, you know me using something that's from the sponsored open source space, but I could do the same thing with uh, a variety of other applications. Um, so I mentioned I was going to run just a fun little app here. It's the one that I do for a lot of demos. Um, it's called the Cats app. Um, and so I'm going to click run here. And again, this is another Python application. And when I run that now and go to my browser, uh, let me switch my screen here. There we go. Um, this displays just random cat images. Um, so it's, it's just a simple application. Again, it's a Python application. I, again, I didn't have to think about how to install it, how do I configure it, um, et cetera. It just works. Um, 
Now imagine again, I'm a developer and I want to you know, start using uh, new databases. You know, maybe we've always been using MySQL or other uh, database systems and I, I wanna try Postgres. Um, I can look at this uh, documentation. I can see all the environment variables I can set to configure how the, the container is gonna actually launch and run. Um, but then when I'm actually ready to, to run it, in this case, I'm actually not going to use the, the graphical interface. I'm gonna use a terminal and use the docker run command to actually launch my container. Now, even though I'm using the, the terminal to launch this, if I go back to the graphical interface, I'll see that the container is, is there. So there's multiple ways to interact with, with containers on my local machine. Um, now, if I go back here and let's actually log into my, my database here, at this point I can, you know, interact with my database. It's an empty database, but if I wanted to start exploring and learning about Postgres, again, I don't have to think about how to install it, how do I configure it. Um, I, you know, I can create a, a, a table here and I can see the table, I can start inserting records. Uh, the ability for me to go from nothing to something is as simple as a Docker run, okay? And again, when I'm done, I, I could just exit out of here um, and then just remove the container and it's gone, okay? Now, I recognize at this point, for the most part, I've just been running single container applications and I'll do a demo in a minute of a, of a more sophisticated uh, development environment. And, and again, why it, it helps me as a developer to be successful, okay? But again, the, the idea here is I'm pulling down these standardized packages that contain everything that need to run an application and it runs in an isolated format without the overhead of a full virtual machine, guest operating system and, and everything else. Okay, so why, why is this all important? Why a container first approach? And I would actually ask, or even potentially rename the title for this of why a container first approach to just what developers want. Um, at the end of the day, this is what developers want. And it's the, kind of the same goals for a container first approach um, that we want speed, we want security, and we want choice. So first off, let's talk about speed. As, as teams and organizations have adopted a, a container-first approach, they've seen their throughput go through the roof. Just like the shipping industry, once there's a standardized way to package up an application, then so much of the other infrastructure along the way of how we deploy our applications, we're no longer having to configure um, different machines for different environments, different applications. Uh, the container image contains everything that needs to run the application, okay? And what that does is it allows throughput to just go through the roof. Um, and so there's some stats on here. I won't read through all of them, but for those that have uh, been in the uh, measuring engineering uh, throughput, there's uh, metrics called the DORA metrics. And all those DORA metrics uh, see significant increases as uh, development teams adopt containers. Um, and so you see a 13 times increase in release frequency that teams are able to deploy more often. And what's interesting though, is as teams deploy more often, you see the stat all the way on the right, um, that there's a seven times decreased change failure rate. So even though they're deploying more often, they're also deploying more, fewer failures. Um, in case you're wondering that 84X decrease MTTR, MTTR is mean time to recovery. So that as teams, you know, oops, something did get deployed that failed, um, the ability to recover from that failure is significantly faster because I can run that same environment locally on my machine and all of the, the, the processes along the way are really focused on how do I deploy as, as quickly and as smoothly as possible. Now, I'm gonna do one quick demo of speed for a developer. Um, and what, what I've got here is a multi-service application. And again, I won't focus too much on it, but you'll, you'll see that there's different services and each of those different services are running different things. There's Python, there's Redis, there's .NET, there's Postgres, there's Node. And traditionally for a developer, I would have to spend a lot of time to figure out how do I set up my environment for all of those different services and, and install the, the different pieces and whatnot. But the, the beautiful thing with, with Docker is now all I have to do is I can define a, a Docker compose file that says here are the different containers. Um, and this container is configured to run my, the Python application. This one is for the Node application. This one's for the .NET and Redis and the database. Um, all these different things, and they all network together so that when I'm ready to actually start development, I can just run Docker Compose up, and it will launch all of these containers, again, in their isolated environments. And as a developer, then, all I have to do is 
um, open up the website. And so I will open it up and then switch my browser over to it. Um, and so this, this simple application is a, a voting app. You know, dogs or cats, which one do we want to vote for? Um, so I'm going to vote for dogs here because I'm a dogs person. And if I open up the results app, then I can see that vote got processed. And just to prove it's not smoke and mirrors, if I change it to cats, uh, we'll see that the vote gets processed. Dogs are better, so I'll put the vote back. <laughs> um, but as a developer now, okay, I'm able to run this entire application environment and it's using containers, which are going to be the same containers that this application will run in, in production. But one of the nice things as, as a developer, again, is my code is also shared with the runtime that the application is running in. So if I make changes to the code base here, maybe I'll change tip to notes and make change your vote super exciting here. As I save the file and go back to my browser and refresh, and we'll see that the text has been updated there. So as a developer, I don't have to install anything on my machine for any of these different services. I just launch containers and the containers contain everything that, that's needed to run the Python code. And so when I made changes to that HTML template, well, the next time I refresh the page, the Python code is using the latest version of that template. And I see that, that change immediately. The feedback loop there is instantaneous, okay? Where traditionally, again, I've had, I had to spend a lot of time to set up my machine and, and get things going, okay? Um, moving on here. Security. Now there's a lot that we can talk about this space, um, but I'll just keep it high level. With containers, we, we have to change a little bit of the way we think about our different environments. So with the virtual machine environment, I'm having to install all the, the things on my machine to run my application. In my staging environment, I have to do the same thing. In my production environment, I have to do the same thing. So I'm, I'm having to replicate my environment everywhere my application needs to run. What's really cool about containers is now I'm promoting my environment rather than having to replicate my environment everywhere. So the, again, the container image contains everything that needs to run my application. My actual machine infrastructure, my compute resources in my stage environments, my production environments, all they need to have is the ability to run a container. Okay? And there's higher level orchestration tools, Kubernetes and Swarm and ECS. And you know, there's a lot of different ways to help manage the running of containers. But at the end of the day, the container contains everything that needs to run an application. So the next time that there's a security vulnerability in production, well then, I, I go back to my dev environment and I, I update my dev environment to a newer dependency or a newer base image or whatever the change might be. And then my CI CD pipelines are going to build the new container image and I'm going to roll that out. So I'm no longer patching production by logging into my production machines and, and doing patches there. In fact, in my previous employment, we, we had a container orchestration platform and even as platform engineers, we couldn't even gain access to our production machines. We didn't have SSH access. And so if we can't have access to our machines, then that, you know, how can an, an attacker gain access to our machines? And again, it's because the container images provide everything that needs to run an application. It just makes our environment so much more secure. So as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that we're doing a lot about is how can we better build container images and have visibility in what's going on um, in there? We've been doing a lot of work with what are called software bill of materials. And you think about the container image, it's basically a manifest of what's in the box. And that manifest gets created when the, the image is built to say, here are all the, the uh, packages, both operating system and application packages. Um, here are the current vulnerabilities, but what, what's best of all is Scout indexes that and, and, and keeps it internally. And so as new vulnerabilities come out, imagine the next log for shell um, vulnerability, Rather than having to go and rescan all your container images, Scout can just simply say, hey, based on the manifest before, here are all the images that have that dependency, here are all the images that are affected, and here's remediation um, advice on how to fix that. So you no longer have to go and rescan all of your images uh, to, to, to fix the issues. And, and best of all, Scout is working to, to help make all of that something that, that developers can do themselves, that they can build the images, they can validate the, um, the images they built against security policies of their organization um, and so much more. Again, we're just getting started here. There's a lot more to help build these secure software supply chains. Um, and this is just a start, but we're really excited about it. Um, I mentioned earlier too that, you know, I, I can see across my organization, here are all the images and here are all the vulnerabilities, here's all the uh, things that I need to fix and, and whatnot. So, um, there's an organizational level view um, that, that comes there. Finally, 
a container first approach really gives developers choices. Um, and there's lots of different choices that, that come along with it um, between languages and frameworks, what services uh, they, they want to use uh, to pass information around, et cetera. Um, but at the end of the day, containers with them being a, a standardized way to package up an application allows me to um, you know, use Java or Go or um, PHP or use the right tool for the job for the, the, the task at hand. Um, and some of these other items here, CI CD systems, you know, you can build container images regardless of the CI CD systems that you're using. The, the containers can run on any cloud, et cetera. So it just gives a lot of flexibility because you're 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 shipping everything that the application needs to run. Okay. So to wrap up here, why a container first approach? Well, because it's what developers want. They want speed, they want security, they want choice. And going back to our original goal, the the more that we can help developers be innovative. And, and focus on innovation and less on everything else, the more successful your business can be, the more successful they can deliver new features and, and capabilities to, to your customers, um, the more reliable the systems be, well, the more secure they'll be, et cetera. Um, so hopefully um, you start to see why we're really excited about containers and uh, we're more than happy to, to help you on your learning journey. One way to help do that is actually, we've got DockerCon coming up in two weeks, uh, very, very soon. And uh, so I want to give a shout out to DockerCon here. We've got a special uh, coupon code for our attendees here. If you uh, register using DC half, um, the, the registration, the in-person registration is, is half half off there. Um, if you'd like to join us virtually, the virtual experience is free as well. Um, but if you'd like to join us in, in LA, which we'd love to, to see and, and meet as many people as possible, um, we'd love to have you there. Um, and again, that's October 4th and 5th. And with that, um, We'll pause there and we'll open up for questions and uh, go from there. All right. Hey, what a great presentation, uh, Michael. Thanks so much. I loved all the demos. Um, you know, the, the more demos, the better is, is kind of my, my, my mantra. You know, you want to you want to see it in action. You want to see it working. I think you can definitely make the case also that containers are are possibly the the single most important innovations after the creation of virtual machines themselves. I mean, I, I think you can, do, you know, we don't have cloud native, you know, w without it, for example. So, uh, so great to hear from you and, yeah. to, uh, and to see what Docker's doing in, in the importance of containers. Um, and DockerCon, what a great show. Uh, that is going to be so much fun to do. So what I'm going to do for, uh, for right now, uh, Michael, is I'm going to put up a poll question while you're answering some questions. Um, and so let us know if you're interested in talking with someone at Docker, I imagine they're ready to talk to you. So, uh, so while that, uh, while we're digging into some of these questions, um, I'm going to leave that poll up. So if you're ready, Michael, let's, uh, let's dive in. Here's a, here's a really sure. good challenging one for you. Are there any use cases in which it doesn't make sense? to use containers. So that's that's mm -hmm. really, uh, yeah, that can be a tough one for someone at Docker to answer, you know? Yeah, and it's always uh, fun to, to figure out, yeah, what are the use cases in which containers may not be the, the best answer? Um, and of course, uh, if I you know, keep my Docker hat on, I'll say they work for everything and they make everything better, but it's, it's not quite true. Um, there, are, for example, Containerized applications work really well, and the, the main focuses are around, you know, running headless applications, so um, or things that are accessed through the network. So, for example, websites or databases or message queues, um, th those types of systems. Now, because of the way that containers work and then the isolation that comes along with them, um, there's not really a, a, an ability as of today with with the operating systems to run native graphical interfaces. So like I can't bundle up my my web browser actually in a, in a container or you know the other things that I, I might be running on my machine. Um, so there are limitations on what you can package up in an app in a container. Um, I've also heard uh, Docker in the past used to have the uh, the mantra build ship run any app anywhere. And that was also at the same time when you know Apple had its uh, you know there's an app for that uh, um, you know, mottos and everything too. So like some folks are like, wait, can I ship my my iOS, my, my native mobile apps as containers and whatnot? And it's like, actually, no, you, you can't do that. Apple has an, an Android and all the, the mobile marketplaces have their own packaging constructs and whatnot. But I will say that 
you know, it's very rare to find a mobile application these days that aren't talking to remote data sources um, and other APIs and whatnot. So you, you typically see the, the mobile applications, sure, they're not containerized, but the services that they're talking to, the, those, those APIs quite often are containerized applications. So they can still fit into kind of the mobile development workflow and, and help mobile developers be successful, but it, that, that mobile app itself isn't a containerized application. So again, there, there are some use cases where containers don't work just because of uh, limitations in either marketplaces or operating systems and whatnot. But, um, but for many other web-based or network-based uh, communications, that kind of stuff, um, containers are, are a great solution there. I think it's safe to say, Michael, that in most situations, containers are are really useful too. So um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, you ready for another challenging one? Um, Let's do it. <laughs> someone asks you this. So it sounds like there are a lot of positives with going container first, and that is correct. So along with that though, there's gotta be some negatives, right? Um, can you point out, now you, you mentioned some just a minute ago, uh, what other negatives are there with containers? Good question. Um, let's see. Uh, while not necessarily a negative, uh, what I see a lot of folks um, think anyways, and I wanna kind of resolve this for, uh, up, up front, is that containers aren't gonna be the magic wand that solves all of your organization's problems. Um, and so a lot of folks that I've, I've seen that have started going down the containerization route. Um, and, and in fact, there's a, there's kind of a funny Dilbert comic that gets passed around internally. Like, you know, you can't be successful just by saying techie things. And then at the, the last slide just says Kubernetes, like just because you're, you're saying, or you're doing it, or you're checking the box, I'm, I'm doing the containers, I'm doing the Kubernetes, I'm, you know, doing these things doesn't mean you're actually going to gain all the efficiency gains that, that come along with it. The slide that I showed earlier that had a lot of the statistics and, and the gains that um, can be seen were because all well, these organizations went all in and figured out, okay, how do I, how do I build my pipelines and, and make them as eff effective and efficient as possible? Um, you know, how do we, do we need to have platform teams that are managing the Kubernetes infrastructures or cloud environments? And so there, there's a, Adopting a tool is fairly easy, but it's the people and cultural processes that are the hardest to change, um, especially in, in, you know, the larger the organization, the harder it is to change. Um, and so I wouldn't necessarily say that's a negative, but it's something to be aware of upfront that there's, there's a lot of mindset changes, there's process changes as, as you raise the abstraction level from virtual machines to containers, it unlocks a lot of benefits, but you also have to be committed to it and, and ready to work on it. And I've seen a lot of companies that, have even started down the, the journey and they just weren't quite ready for it um, or they didn't have the, the right people there and that kind of stuff. And then they're like, okay, maybe this isn't quite the time for us yet. And they went back to their virtual machine route um, because that was what was familiar. So again, it, there's a lot of benefits that get unlocked with it, but you have to be ready to, to, to make the investment with it to, to unlock them. Is it fair to say there's more moving parts when you, when you add containers to an environment or would you think that's... Um, I would say that's a good question. I, if I were to look at a quantitative, like an actual number, I don't know if there's going to be more or less, but I would say they're just different parts. And there's, so there's new tools, there's new things to learn. But I actually, my, my first gut reaction was there may actually be fewer tools, fewer parts, because kind of going back to that shipping analogy, the way that I move around, you know, a, a barrel and box and bag, like I've got to have different tools for each of those different things. You know, the same thing for if I'm deploying VMs that have Python or Java or, you know, pick your languages, pick your tools, like you're having to build a lot more tooling around that. Well, once you've got standardized containers, it helps you standardize a lot of your tool set and everything. So it's it's different tools, yeah. um, which, again, is going to be more of a learning curve there. Um, but that standardization unlocks a lot of that the, the benefits that come through standardization, too. Sure. Okay. Now, in your last answer, you did bring up the K word. So, so uh -oh. we do, you know, we do have another question then related to sure. that. Um, so, one of the questions is, what role does Kubernetes play in this ecosystem? And one another way to kind of maybe frame that is, are they complementary? Do they play well together? Kind of, how do they exist in the same universe here? Yeah. Great question. Um, and it, it's interesting to me 
the number of people that still come up to, to me at, at conferences or, or that kind of stuff and like, okay, I'm doing Kubernetes now, help me learn containers. And it's like, wait a second, but let's get back to some of the basics here. Um, so for those that have been involved in Docker's history for many years, I've known that in, in the past, many years ago, Docker was trying to do a little bit of everything. Uh, they did development and, and focusing on development, but they also had enterprise products to help run an operation space. Um, and so they had um, products around um, wrapping Kubernetes, but they also had their own orchestration system called Swarm at that time. And so that's where a lot of the friction and and, and that's kind of hung on a little bit of you know, Docker versus Kubernetes. But several years ago now, Docker sold off all those pieces to another company called Marantis, and they and they continue to support those products, and it's a fantastic product. Um, but Docker has re envisioned and refocused itself on the developer space. How do we use containers in development? How do we help developers be innovative and, and effective, efficient, et cetera? And then once you've got these container images, how you run those container images, that's completely up to you. Um, so whether you're using Kubernetes or using Nomad or ECS or Swarm or like, we don't know or we, we don't care. Um, and there's there's a lot of power that comes from that ag agnosticness. Um, and, and so in many ways, it's, it's, no, it's no longer a Docker versus Kubernetes. It's a Docker and Kubernetes uh, discussion. And, and so, yeah, you can build your containers on, on your local machine and you can run them in Kubernetes in, in production. And in fact, actually Docker Desktop now has a, you know, if you just go and check a box and hit apply and you've got a Kubernetes cluster running on your local machine. Sure, it's, it's just a single node cluster and it has limitations and, and whatnot um, compared to what you might have in your production environments. But you can test out your manifest and your Helm charts and, and all the different things uh, on your local machine. So, um, and for those that may not be quite familiar with like what what problem is Kubernetes even solved? It's really focused around how do I run my applications, my containerized workloads across a fleet of machines. And you can kind of think of it like an air traffic controller system, where it's okay. This container needs to run there, and okay, you wanted three copies of this up for high availability. Is that the case? And and it is basically yeah, orchestrating your containerized workloads in your production environment. So yeah, think of Docker a lot on the developer side of things and how do we build those images? And then Kubernetes is one of the tools that can be used to how do you run those now in your production environment at scale? Okay. Yeah, terrific answer. They, uh, you know, they're complementary. I mean, I, I think that's yeah. that's the bottom line and you have options, don't you? Now you have more exactly. options, which is always good for developers. That is for sure. Okay, um, another great one here and, and something that a lot of people wonder about. Uh, so someone asked, I have a bunch of old legacy applications I'm maintaining and who doesn't really uh, in most environments. Does it make sense to put those uh, legacy apps into containers also? Yeah, great question. Um, in fact, I was actually just having a conversation with a, a colleague of mine who's doing a talk at DockerCon uh, in two weeks on this exact topic as well, too. So I won't steal too much of his thunder, but um, at the end of the day, when, when we think about containers, it, it's just a standardized way to package up an application. And that application can be um, you know, a, a cutting edge microservice or whatever it might be. But at the end of the day, also a, a traditional legacy application can go into a container as well. And once you've got this containerized application that's your monolithic application or you know, your legacy application, whatever you want to call it, um, now you've, you can reap the benefits that come along through the standardization of containers. Now you can take this legacy application and deploy it using Kubernetes uh, and all the other systems that you might be using for your containers. Um, and, and it effectively is decoupling the application from the host operating system or the, the, the machine itself. Um, I've talked to many, many folks that have, you know, are supporting these legacy applications, like the developer that wrote it is long gone. And in fact, we don't even know how it actually gets deployed. So, you know, if that machine ever dies, we hope we can recreate it kind of thing. We, we've got a virtual machine snapshot and that's about as, if, you know, as good of a backup as we have here. Um, and they're scared of those moments. And so by taking the time to figure out how, to, how can you take that application and put it into a container, it, it resolves all those concerns of now now the, the application is independent of that host infrastructure is portable and you can start to reap again some of those benefits of the, the containerized environment and then in the future if you decide to rewrite or rebuild or break it up in microservices you know that that's a decision that you can make um you know if your business needs supported etc um, but even just by containerizing the legacy application 
um, you, you reap a lot of benefits. <laughs> in fact, there was a um, several Docker cons ago. I, it's a long story, but I was roaming around the vendor hall in an inflatable dino suit. And we had these little protest signs is like even dino apps deserve love too. like, you know, your, your old dinosaur legacy applications, you know, they deserve love too. And they, 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 they can benefit from uh, being containerized as well too. So the next time you're on with us, Mike, I think we need to see pictures. Okay. Of, oh, of we, we can make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So um, before we wrap today, uh, Michael, you've, you've presented so much great information on Docker. For those who are interested now in taking that next step, what do you recommend they do? Um, so yeah, for next steps, the first thing I'll say is actually tune into DockerCon in two weeks. Um, there's there's going to be a lot of great information, a lot of... Uh, you know, both of new products, but exist, um, now things that we already have there. On day zero, there's going to be several workshops as well, too, that you can uh, uh, tune in. To, if you're joining virtually, the Getting Started with Docker Workshop, which is actually one I will be running, um, is, is free to everybody. The other three workshops, if you're joining virtually, there is a, a paid aspect to that as well. But, um, you know, check us out there. Our Docker documentation is fantastic. Our docs team does uh, takes great pride in the, the docs that are there. Um, and so I'd encourage you to, to check those out as well. And then I would also just say, you know, spend time in the community. Um, we, we've got community Slack as well, but the, there's a, just a ton of content out there on YouTube and TikTok and Instagram and just blog posts and all over the place. Um, it's one of the things that we're, we're really proud of is just the, the vast and vibrant community that we have. And there's not many things, many questions that you can have that there isn't an answer, a course, a YouTube video or, or something else around it as well, too. If if people go to the Docker website, you just recently wrote a blog too on the top four things you're looking forward to at uh, you know at DockerCon. <laughs> really good information uh, in yeah. there. I would also add that Los Angeles in early October is a really nice place to be. Um, you know, yes. so I, I think it's just going to be a great show. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for putting together a fantastic presentation for all of your insights in the Q and A. Uh, I had so much fun doing this with you today. Uh, thanks again. Absolutely. Thanks, Keith. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. My pleasure. Okay. Um, so everyone, that is going to put a uh, wrap on this session uh, for today. But before we let you go, we do have one more piece of business to take care of. That is the Amazon gift card prize drawing. As I mentioned at the beginning, you do have to be present for the entire event to be eligible to win the prize. And we do have a winner for today's $250 Amazon gift card. And that winner is Chris Rompot from Iowa. Congratulations, Chris. We'll be in touch very soon to get you your card. And with that, everyone, uh, we're just about out of here. On behalf of the Actual Tech Media team, I want to thank Docker for making this possible. I want to thank Michael for being here and for uh, all of that knowledge. And I want to thank all of you for being here with us for your great questions. And I uh, want to uh, let you know that um, the handouts are still available for a few more seconds. Download those while I'm wrapping all of this up. Uh, and I uh, want uh, to say that it was such a pleasure to be here with you. I hope you enjoyed being here and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Have a great rest of your day.